there are many challenges, but I think they are all interrelated. So, in a way, you could say that makes it simpler, but in another way, it makes it much harder to sort, because you cannot just sort one and then sort another one, and, you know, there is no order. Uh, the complexity and the intricacy means that you have to find ways of sorting all these problems at once. And I think perhaps the first one we may want to think of, which is at the core of many other problems, um, is that we need to eat. Because we are biological organisms and we cannot survive without food and water. And because there are many of us, we are 7 billion and uh, we are heading towards apparently being 9 billions. <laughs> So it is a fact that, you know, needs to be taken into consideration. All of these challenges somehow go back to one challenge, which is how are we going to have enough food to feed our growing population? The problem is how to sort it. What kind of knowledge do we need of the world that we don't, need, we, we don't have yet in order to sort it? And there might be a new battle of ideas coming up there because a lot of people are aware that this is an important issue. We do have enough food to feed the population we have now. That's something that some people would prefer to forget because they like to invent new things, <laughs> create new artificial ways of creating more out of little. And um, therefore, some people do agitate this idea that we are running out of resources, that resources are scarce, and particularly food is scarce. I cannot say definitely that this will not be a risk or a danger in the future, but it's not true now. And we have enough of everything we need now, but we don't know how to design systems that make the best use of what we have. And we are not using enough of the knowledge that is already existing, because in some quarters of science, it's always about pushing the frontier and inventing new things, creating new genetically modified organisms, for example, instead of looking at the way we could produce very varied food today without having these new organisms that have not been created by humans yet. It's not a problem you can address science by science, discipline by discipline, subfield by subfield. You need to get all the knowledge we have together in a holistic, meaningful manner in order to really address it. Because it's a problem that has to do with biophysical properties, it has to do with biological properties, it has to do with evolutionary trends, it has to do with morals and ethics, it has to do with politics, with economics, with um, ideas, with so many things. In the last 15 years, a lot of scientists coming from the natural science perspective, and I am a social scientist, have started to agree together on looking at the world from a new perspective and they call that earth sciences. For them, earth science means that all the different very specialized fields of scientific knowledge we have have to come together to look at the earth as one single unit, if you want. And so it goes much further than the Gaia hypothesis, which was very controversial when it was first articulated by a scientist in the 70s, 80s. And a concept that is important for the scientists is what they call planetary boundaries. So the idea is that there are geophysical limits to the world, and this is what constitutes both our freedom and our sense of responsibility. So natural scientists tell us that. Now what can we do as social scientists? 
where do we start? Unfortunately, I think that social scientists and people in the humanities for the last 20 years have been a little bit navel gazing and everything that was coming from the natural sciences or the hard sciences was taken as a discourse, um, as something that had to be disconstructed uh, rather than as something that had to be engaged with as giving you some sense of, you know, some sense of the reality in which we're living. And I think this is one of the challenges we have. So, as a social scientist, listening to what natural scientists coming from the earth science are telling us, thinking as an anthropologist that we are living beings that need food and water, I have thought very hard about it and I'm preparing now a research proposal that will bring people from very, very different disciplines together just to sit them at a table and agree together on what the research gaps are and on where we need more research and what kind of research and how we will do this research to solve these problems. Just that is a very complex exercise, but I can tell you that as an anthropologist, I see the knowledge of traditional tribal indigenous people as being quite important in that, in that conversation uh, because they have forms of knowledge and they have types of knowledge which can be very relevant to the predicament in which we are finding ourselves. And I'm just going to give you one example. We have five or six themes in this research proposal, but one of them has to do with uh, the research I have done in the Amazon region. So I work in the Amazon basin for many years, archaeologists thought this is, and scientists thought this is the last wilderness on earth. Us anthropologists and archaeologists have been arguing that this forest had been inhabited by people for thousands of years and that signs of their being there were still present, one. And second, that people being in the forest didn't make the forest less uh, biodiverse, but in, on the contrary, more biodiverse. Archaeologists in the last 15 years have worked on what we call rice fields and mounds and signs of human presence in the forest. And also on anthropogenic soils. And so all that means what seems natural are in fact the artifacts of people living there, maybe three, four, five hundred years ago the last people living there. And by examining the chemical properties of the earth that they have changed by putting charcoal in, in these very impoverished soils, they have managed to make the soil much more rich for cultivation, by raising earth so that you escape flooding. I don't know if you've seen the Chawel River this morning, but um, <laughs> You know, this kind of flooding is happening all the time. And then by raising the earth and cultivating on mounds, you are combining the elements in a way that allows intensive cultivation in this kind of environments. And by combining plants uh, and creating a vast uh, varietal diversity of each of these crops, they have, we estimate, managed to feed um, very large populations. And so, part of this project is to get plant physiologists, soil specialists, um, evolutionary ecologists, anthropologists, archaeologists, um, people who are specialists in myths as well, to all come together and to examine um, what was done all this time ago, what we can learn from it and what is still done today in similar environments to try to sort the systems we are using and inventing systems that are more sustainable.